Well, thank you, and uh, I also appreciate very much the opportunity to help with this uh, epic uh, uh, Foundation 20th anniversary celebration, but also, um, perhaps even more important, our anticipation uh, of new partnerships and new directions uh, the, uh, addressing the, the overarching 21st century uh, challenges. Um, I will direct my remarks at one of those, uh, the challenges of energy technology and innovation. Uh, and indeed, I would say that at MIT, it has been quite a phenomenon uh, when President Hockfield uh, issued her inaugural challenge to the campus and labeled uh, energy uh, and the associated environmental challenges as an overarching one for applying the kinds of skills uh, that our students are developing at MIT to energy, the response of the campus was enormous. We now have 25% of the faculty roughly engaged in this area, so I think this will be a fantastic area, again, for a new level of collaboration uh, with our partners uh, here, in, here in Taiwan. Now, um, I'm going to address this uh, principally in the, level, uh, in, the, in the context of the uh, challenges uh, to climate. Uh, uh, however, uh, I will also note the benefits for security and, of course, the benefits for developing a technology-based economy. But my colleague, uh, Don Lassard, uh, already started this conversation uh, earlier this morning, uh, and we will pick up uh, in some ways from where he left off. I'll start by showing uh, something that Don effectively showed, but I will uh, borrow uh, from my colleagues, uh, uh, Professors Jacoby and Prin, uh, a different way of looking at it, uh, uh, kind of emphasizing the gamble that we are taking uh, in uh, continuing to emit uh, carbon dioxide uh, into the atmosphere. So this is the roulette wheel that represents the risks that we are taking in this century if we continue on our current path. We can spin that roulette wheel, uh, and it gives you an idea of the probability of various uh, global temperature rises. If you remember, two degrees is generally viewed uh, as kind of a reasonably safe uh, 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 environment. Uh, you, we don't have a very good chance of two degrees coming up uh, in this roulette wheel. Uh, and so what happens when we work down uh, in terms of the concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, uh, even to something like 650 parts per million, in this language, we have a new roulette wheel, one that is much more favorable for us to spin, uh, one that at least gets us down into the range uh, of the, uh, the areas which we think are, are at least uh, reasonably low risk. Uh, but even perhaps more important, what you see is by working at this, we eliminate, essentially, the distribution that can be really catastrophic, the four, five, six, seven degree centigrade rise. So this is a, 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 a challenge that we must uh, come up to, uh, stand up to, uh, and uh, technology, innovation, and other forms of innovation will be critical, uh, as I will discuss. But first, let's get an idea of the scale of the challenge. I'm not going to go through the numbers. You will have to take this uh, arithmetic uh, on face value for the moment. But fundamentally, to achieve these kinds of goals, let's say by mid-century, we will be talking about an average of about two tons of carbon dioxide emissions per person uh, in the globe with nine or 10 billion uh, people by mid-century. Where are we today? Well, here's a list of of a select number of countries, mostly large countries, uh, ordered by GDP per capita from left to right. Uh, and you can see uh, 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 GDP per capita and then CO2 per capita. Remember we talked about, let's call it two tons per person. Well, the United States, we're at about 20. Uh, and we can work down here. Taiwan, uh, in both of those rows, you should insert, roughly speaking, between Japan and Saudi Arabia. Roughly two-thirds of the U.S. level in both GDP and CO2 per capita, uh, essentially the same ratio, a ratio slightly higher than Japan, a ratio much, much better than that in mainland China, a factor of two better in terms of carbon intensity, which I think is an important thing to keep in mind 
uh, as one looks forward uh, to the kind of technology-based approach that we will, we will discuss. So we can see this is a big challenge. Uh, we're talking about a very, very radically different energy system uh, in several decades down the road. And in fact, it's not hard to then conclude that what we are talking about is a dramatic acceleration of the transformation of the energy marketplace compared to historical norms. Uh, basically, the historical norm is that the energy system changes dramatically in about 50 years. If you go through the arithmetic of what we just looked at, we don't have 50 years. We have to accelerate this down to let's call it maybe a 20 kind of year time scale to have new technologies at scale uh, deployed uh, in all of our major, major economies. So that's, that's the challenge. We must draw upon science and engineering, certainly, but also management, social science, policy and planning. If we are to do that, indeed, the innovation we need is multifaceted. The argument is for this kind of an historic acceleration of transformation, what we need is to have technology innovation, business model innovation, and policy innovation all working together. The goal of technology innovation may not sound glamorous. It's basically cost reduction. We have to get the cost of low carbon technologies much, much closer to those uh, that we use today. Business model integration. I believe we have to find the key to matching the entrepreneurial cultures, which are alive and well. Uh, in fact, they are at, uh, they are at, at, at unprecedented levels today uh, in, in the energy space. But we have to match those up with the culture of large energy companies, for example, uh, who can implement at scale in a rapid way. And we need policy innovation. Now, let me talk about that by, and I'll go back then to technology innovation. Let me talk about that in the context of Don Lessard's last line on his last slide. Policymakers must reduce the gap between environmental and economic value propositions. And I completely and wholeheartedly agree with that. However, let's also recognize the left-hand column in blue are the characteristics that policymakers like. There should be no cost. Uh, there should be no effect in different groups in society. It should provide reliability. It should provide visible results. Those are the ideal conditions for a policymaker to put forward a new policy. Let's talk about climate change and low carbon. Well, it's higher cost. It makes winners and losers. For example, coal, for example, uh, clearly uh, is difficult to sustain uh, if we're going to crank down on carbon. Some of these technologies are intermittent. They are a challenge for reliability. It's an early action delayed benefit equation. So this just tells you it is a difficult policy environment, which is why I come to the conclusion that what we need is the lead, in fact, from technology portfolio innovation that addresses those issues, that lowers the cost, enables all fuels, enhances system resilience and reliability, promotes a clean environment, improves energy security. With those technology advances, the policy will be a lot easier to bring into sync with the, with the needs uh, that we have just outlined. In terms of business models, I'll borrow a slide from another colleague, Yet Ming Chang, um, in which the left-hand part represents the utility industry, multi-trillion dollar industry. The wheel represents the transportation industry, multi-trillion dollar industry. Industries that today are essentially completely distinct. And what that little cartoon shows is in the middle a peanut, the $50 billion global battery industry. It's an example where, however, when technology advances and that battery industry is one that provides low cost, reliable, long lifetime energy storage, suddenly the business model will be totally different with those, with those industries, in fact, interacting. And there are many more examples of that. We have to think in innovative ways as to how business will be reordered 
with these new clean energy technologies. So now going back to technology itself, here is, uh, this is kind of my own Michelin guide uh, with various stars uh, to different technology pathways. We don't have time to go through all this. Let me just give my conclusion is that the two most critical leading areas for this transformation are one, energy efficiency, as Don, in fact, emphasized this morning. And there are many ways to getting efficiency in our buildings, in our vehicles, in our supply chains, industrial processes, and one that I would like to emphasize, uh, very appropriate to some of the strengths here in Taiwan, is the issue of smart infrastructure and the incorporation of information technology in ways that are only being scratched on the surface in terms of energy utilization in ways that will provide efficiency plus reliability, resilience, et cetera. A, a tremendously open field and one perhaps ripe uh, for our partnership. And secondly, carbon-free electricity. Because electricity, you tend to have fixed sources uh, and it turns out this is an excellent place with, me with many options for addressing the low carbon future. The one part I add to that, if you go down a couple of lines, is storage. Uh, we just saw it in that cartoon about the, essentially the electric vehicle, uh, but it's also true, for example, to enable uh, intermittent sources like wind and solar. So storage, carbon-free electricity, and efficiency are really the places where we have to work very, very hard in this decade to start scaling new solutions. I'll just comment briefly uh, on solar research, one of those uh, critical technologies uh, at MIT. Uh, we have a very, very robust program in this area. Uh, I'm just going to kind of indicate uh, what some of those are. Clearly, photovoltaics are very important. Uh, for Silicon photovoltaics, cost reduction. There are many, many aspects to this involving the, the relatively obvious uh, in terms of uh, of the materials, the solar cells, uh, uh, improvements, et cetera. But balance of plant is critical. Uh, the balance of plant is, let's say, half the cost. So we have to work on that as well. We have to work on integrating these systems into the grid. We have to have new business models, workforce development. All of these various aspects are all, in fact, areas of research and education. Then thin film, but then I also note there is the frontier beyond silicon uh, uh, and, uh, and thin films. Some of the examples are there, but take, take for example, polymers, roll-to-roll -roll polymers. Right now, very low efficiency. But if we can work that up, this is an example of where we may make it up by having dramatically lowered balance of plant costs. So there's a, it's a multifaceted research agenda uh, also going to nanoscale issues like, like quantum dots uh, that are very, very promising and could provide the major breakthrough technologies uh, looking forward. 